changes in, in monetary policy. Uh, but finally, I think the um, uh, Federal Reserve is a remarkable institution. Um, it has a superb staff. A great We're going to leave this now. You can see all of Mr. Bernanke's remarks on C-SPAN 2 tonight at just after 11 p.m. Eastern. The House is coming back in now for a handful of votes on amendments to the Energy and Water Project spending bill. Mr. Price, kindly take the chair. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union of, for further consideration of H.R. 2609, which the Clerk will report by title. A bill making appropriations for energy and water development and related agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2014, and for other purposes. When the Committee of the Whole rose earlier today, the amendment offered by the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, had been disposed of, and the bill had been read through page 60, line 12. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from California seek rec res recognition? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I request uh, unanimous consent to withdraw my request for a recorded vote on my amendment to the end that the amendment stand is deposed of by the voice vote taken on the amendment. Without objection. <laughs> The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number 29, printed in the congressional record, offered by Ms. Bass of California. Is there objection? Without objection, the request for a recorded vote is withdrawn. Accordingly, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, proceedings will now resume on those amendments on which further proceedings were postponed in the following order. Amendment by Mr. Polis of Colorado. Amendment by Mr. Burgess of Texas. Amendment by Mr. Burgess of Texas. Amendment by Ms. Titus of Nevada. An amendment by Mr. Lynch of Massachusetts. The chair will reduce to five minutes the time for any electronic vote after the first vote in the series. The unfinished business is the request for a recorded vote on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Polis of Colorado. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a 15-minute vote. This is day two of debate on amendments to the Energy and Water Spending Bill for 2014. The bill is being considered under an open amendment process. That means members can offer as many germane amendments as they'd like. Here's an update on where things stand on the bill. Ari Natter, energy reporter at BNA News, how's the House debate going on the Energy and Water Spending Bill? Uh, it's definitely going. Um, they're working their way through a lot of amendments uh, and they could be working late into tonight and maybe part of Thursday as well. How much money is proposed in the bill and how does it compare with past years? Right. Well, this uh, bill would appropriate uh, about $30 billion, which is about $2 billion less than last year's version. Uh, what's interesting about it to me is the amount of money that would be appropriated to the Energy Department, which is about $3 billion less than last year. It's 25 a uh, billion, actually a little bit less than that, and this bill would dramatically cut funding for renewable and uh, energy efficiency. So that's that's interesting, and it's it kind of it's kind of laying bare the the priorities of uh, Democrats and Republicans in this debate. Talk a little bit more about that. Why does that interest you? Uh, well, Obama's issued a, a veto threat largely because of that reason. He says under funds, uh, he said critical investments in clean energy. Uh, there's also a veto threat because the bill would uh, allow the Energy Department to proceed with Yucca Mountain, the nuclear waste repo repository that uh, the Obama administration opposes. So you've seen a lot of Democratic amendments to try to increase the renewable funding, and so far they've, they've pretty much all been defeated. There have been some Republican amendments passed, uh, actually taking a little bit less away from, from those uh, programs and transferring them to, to other areas. As you mentioned, there's been a lot of talk about clean energy programs. What's that debate about? Uh, well, like I said, I think it, it's, it kind of lays bare the priorities. 
of uh, Republicans and Democrats in the House. Generally speaking, Republicans are more in favor of fossil fuels, which they say are uh, reliable, dependable, and producing electricity now, while Democrats say uh, we need to invest in, in clean energy for the future and also to, to mitigate the impacts of climate change. How does the House bill compare with the Senate's version? Uh, the Senate's version is, is larger. Uh, it's about $4 billion larger than the House version. And uh, also, it increases funding for clean energy. There's about $5 million more for the Energy Department's main uh, clean energy spending programs than what's uh, currently funded in enacted levels. So um, that's pretty interesting, and that's a pretty big difference between the two bills. So that's something they're going to have to work out. The, the Senate bill is, uh, may go to the floor later this month. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid has said he wants to bring that bill to the floor uh, by the end of this month. You said that the bill is really opening up and letting us see what the priorities are for both the Democrats and the Republicans. How is the bill likely to fare on final passage? Um, I would be surprised if it failed. If they have the votes to, to pass it, and my prediction is it'll pass along party lines. Ari Natter is an energy reporter at BNA News. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. The amendment the House is voting on now would reduce weapons activities by $13 million, which Representative Polis, who offered the amendment, intended to be cut from a specific warhead program. House Republicans met today to talk about how to handle immigration legislation. Here's how the Associated Press is writing about it. House Republicans on Wednesday confronted the politically volatile issue of immigration. Their ranks divided and their way forward unclear, even as national GOP leaders pressured them to act. House Democrats also weighed in on the issue today. We'll watch what they had to say during this vote. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. I'm very honored to be here today with my colleagues, uh, the, the co-chairs of the Border Caucus, Congressman Grijalva of Arizona, Congressman Bella from uh, Texas. Uh, I'm also with uh, Congressman Beto O'Rourke from Texas and a uh, senior member of Congress, member of our leadership, who will wrap up for us, Congressman Cuellar of Texas. So we'll be hearing from them in that order. Uh, but first, I just wanted to acknowledge that this morning, President George W. Bush urged a positive resolution to, to the debate on immigration and expressed hope uh, that, as we, that we keep a benevolent spirit in mind as we understand the contributions immigrants make to our country. Beautiful thought. Uh, two weeks ago, the Senate passed a bipartisan bill. Uh, we hope now that the House will act again in a bipartisan way. In that spirit, I sent a letter to Speaker Boehner today urging bipartisan action to pass comprehensive immigration reform, highlighting the work of the bipartisan task force of seven. Uh, we have uh, uh, always moved forward on the principles of our Hispanic, Congressional Hispanic Caucus to, to um, secure our borders, protect our workers, unite our families, and provide an, an earned pathway to citizenship. Each element of this has bipartisan support. Secure our borders. A bill came out of the Homeland Security Committee, McCall Thompson, Dem Republican and Democrat, with unanimous support on Homeland Se Security. McCall Cuellar, a Border uh, Communities Economic Security and Sustainability Act. Mr. Cuellar will talk about that. McCall, Republican, Cuellar, Democrat. Cuellar, McCall, Fahrenheit, Cross-Border Trade Enactment. So it's about border security, but it's also about economic security at the border. And then so if, you want to, if you want to talk about a path to uh, legal permanent status that leads to citizenship, that's in the Senate bill, bipartisan support. So every element that you can name, uh, just about every element you can name, is something that already has bipartisan support or has been initiated 
uh, by the, uh, the Republicans, I think there is a path uh, to uh, comprehensive immigration reform. I'm honored to be here with our, our border caucus who have brought forth some of the concerns uh, that they have or some of the ideas uh, that they suggest would be better ideas than some of what we have seen so far. Let's hear it from them. I'm going to please to yield to a very distinguished chair of the uh, Border Caucus, a gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Grijalva. Thank you very much, uh, Leader Pelosi, and, and uh, uh, very significant that you've joined us today and helped initiate this discussion. Uh, the discussion of immigration reform as the Republicans retreat into their conclave to decide what they're going to do or not do, what their priorities are, be, are going to be, uh, Border Caucus feels very strongly and it's re reiterated by the leader about a pathway to citizenship, but we also feel really strongly that part of the security of our borders has to do with economic security on our borders, has to do with ports of entry that are functional, enhanced trade and commerce, and has to do with full staff staffing of customs, and my colleagues will talk more in detail about that. I want to talk about one aspect. 5,750 lives have been lost in the last 10 years in the border. I represent 350 miles along the Arizona border, and uh, 2,700 have died in that area. And this year, again, a spike in the number of deaths. So we're asking that part of the consideration needs to be humanitarian support, search and rescue, how to educate and prevent those deaths, targeting human trafficking, all have to be part of border security. The definition of border security has been uh, hijacked to talk just about how many, what armaments, what technology. Uh, the Border Caucus feels that the definition for the borderlands of security is expansive, it includes economics, it, it, it includes the humanitarian support, and uh, we feel that as we move forward, uh, the Speaker and his caucus have an immense responsibility uh, not only to move a bipartisan bill forward, and many of the elements we'll talk about today are indeed bipartisan, but also, more importantly, uh, to, have, to have the temperament and the courage to put something together that will solve this issue for the long term, not a quick political fix, but a long term. Uh, resolution, and part of it includes the agenda of the Border Caucus. With that, let me introduce a uh, valued friend, co-chair of the Border Caucus from Texas, uh, Congressman Vela, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Leader Pelosi and Congressman Grijalva. Uh, I represent uh, 550,000 people on the southern border of Texas. Uh, <coughs> my anchor city is the city of Brownsville. Uh, my position uh, on the fence, I believe, is well stated. Uh, the the um, introduction of additional border fencing um, is something that to me does not make sense. But the re one of the reasons is because it doesn't make any economic sense. We have a valuable trading partner with Mexico. Uh, you'll see that six million United States jobs depend on trade with Mexico. Um, since 1993 uh, to 2012, uh, trade with Mexico has skyrocketed. Our bilateral goods and services uh, trade has reached an estimated $536 billion in 2012, which is a new record. Uh, Mexico has become the United States' third largest trading partner after Canada and China, uh, you will see. And Mexico uh, is our second largest export, export market in the world. And the other thing is if you go uh, and evaluate the economic impact of our trade with Mexico on a state-by-state -state basis, what you see is that in Speaker Boehner's uh, state, state of Ohio, uh, the total volume of uh, the state of Ohio's trade with the country of Mexico is $4.3 billion. With Whit Cantor, state of Virginia, $1.336 billion. And finally, in the state of California, a whopping $59.68 billion. 
all other arguments about the fence aside, just the symbolic nature of constructing more fence uh, along the border of a country with whom we have uh, such great business relationships uh, doesn't make any sense. And with that, uh, I introduce uh, Congressman Beto O'Rourke uh, from our sister city of El Paso. Thank you. And I, I want to start by saying that I'm very grateful uh, for the leadership that we have here in the House uh, with Leader Pelosi, uh, the leadership that we saw in a bipartisan manner in the Senate, so that we finally have, after decades, a comprehensive immigration bill with a pathway to citizenship that we can talk about and hopefully improve. And that's why we're here today, is to talk about how we improve this bill. Uh, I come from El Paso, Texas, uh, which forms with Ciudad Juarez one half of one of the largest binational communities anywhere in the world. It's an incredibly beautiful place. It's economically vital to the success of this country. And it's amazingly safe by any measure. In fact, El Paso, Texas is the safest city in the United States today. It was the safest city last year. It was the safest city the year before that. San Diego, another border community, is the second safest. Laredo is one of the, the safest communities as well. So I'm here to say that it's really important to view the border as an opportunity and not a threat. And you wouldn't know that from reading the Corker Hoven Amendment in the current offering from the Senate in their comprehensive immigration bill. So I want to work cooperatively with my colleagues uh, in the Congress and the House, uh, with those in the Senate, if, if ultimately it comes to conference, to improve this bill so that we make the most out of our opportunities at the border. Congressman Vela showed how much we are dependent on trade with Mexico, on the six million jobs that are produced from that trade in the United States, on the billions of dollars of economic activity. If we diverted uh, even a fraction of the $40 billion in the Corker Hoven Amendment that militarizes the U.S.-Mexico border to facilitating trade and economic growth, we'd create millions more jobs in the United States, uh, billions of dollars more in economic activity. And really, at the end of the day, Republican or Democrat, that's why we're here, to create jobs, to create opportunity, to create economic growth. So I look forward to working with the leadership and, frankly, working with members from both sides of the aisle to improve this, to ensure that we have a bill that is humane, that is rational, and that is fiscally responsible, and that at the end of the day creates jobs, creates opportunity, along with the pathway to citizenship. So look forward to uh, answering any questions that you all might have. And with that, I want to introduce Congressman Cuellar, uh, one of the great representatives of the U.S. side of the U.S.-Mexico border. Thank you so much, Beto. Thank you for your leadership. First of all, I want to thank uh, Leader Pelosi. Uh, Leader Pelosi has traveled the border. She's been in Laredo, El Paso, uh, the Brownsville area, McAllen. She's traveled. She understands that. So we want to thank her for, for taking the time to go up there because I always find an interest in the people that have never been to the border. I've always the ones that come up with the solutions for the border, and she's been down there, and I appreciate it. Uh, the uh, Border Caucus, we're here for one reason. We live in the border, we drink the water, we breathe the air, so I think we should know the border a lot better than some folks that have never been down to the border. Economics. Uh, I just got back from uh, Mexico actually about a week ago. I spent about three days in Mexico. I got to sit down with senators and congressmen and business people there in Mexico City. And the first thing they said was, what are you all up to there in the United States? What are you trying to do to us? We're a big trading partner, and as both uh, the folks have mentioned a few minutes ago, think about this. 40% of all the exports from the United States, all the exports from the United States go to Mexico and Latin America, 40% of what we do. Besides the 6 million jobs that we have, every day there's $1.2 billion of trade between the U.S. and Mexico. But the most important thing is to show you how connected we are with the Republic of Mexico as an example. If a product comes in, an import comes from Canada, I mean from, uh, from China, it will have about 4% American parts. But if you have an import come in from Mexico, it will have 40% American parts. So it tells you how connected we are. The problem that we got to be very careful with is that the border is a very dynamic area. And as is, as is mentioned a few minutes ago, if you come up with a single dimension where you say all you need is border patrol and all you, all you need is a fence and that will solve the problem, you're missing 
the dynamics of the border. For example, right now the federal judges on the border are the, the ones that have the largest caseload. So if you add more border patrol, you create more cases, and you add to the uh, to the federal judges' caseload, you're forgetting about the federal adding more federal judges. You forget about adding more prosecutors, more public defenders, U.S. marshals. You're just adding one dimension. The other thing is, as uh, it was mentioned right now by Raul, is that they're they're just thinking about the men and women in green, which is Border Patrol. But what about the men and women in blue, which are the CBP officers? 80% uh, plus of all the goods and people that come into the United States come through land ports. And we're not putting the infrastructure. We're not adding the men and women in blue, which is CBP. And we got to think not single dimension, but multi dimension. Uh, again, one more thing, because I feel very strongly about the fence, like Phil said. Uh, the fence is a false sense of security. It really is. Uh, and if you look at it, it is a 14th century solution to a 21st century problem that we have. I can see it that if we built this fence, and by the way, the, uh, you know, there's a provision that we've got to be careful. It says no fence specifically on the northern border, but on the southern border they want to put more fence. But if you add more fence to the southern border, I can see it one day where a Mexican president will be on the other side of the wall facing the United States and say, like Reagan did, years ago and say, Mr. President, tear down this wall. So we have to make sure that when we talk about border security, that it is sensible, strong border security. And this is why we're here together as members from the border where we live, we drink the water, we breathe the air, and we understand the border better than other folks. Thank you so much, and thank you, Madam Leader. Now, it's very interesting to hear the volume of trade that goes back and forth, and one of the reasons we're interested in more infrastructure and more um, um, assistance with personnel for uh, facilitating commerce is that it takes time. The more time people have to wait to get in, the more they have to choose other options like flying, which makes the product not competitive. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's all connected. Right. It's all connected. So if you want to do some things there, if you want infrastructure, have it be ex uh, infrastructure that facilitates commerce and trade and family uh, unification rather than, um, rather than uh, make it more expensive to trade with Mexico. Yes, ma'am. Um, to that poor gentleman behind you, could any of you vote for the Senate bill as it currently exists today with those border security provisions, or does that make it so that you can't support it? Well, why don't we just hold that for when we see what comes out of the House? We have been very, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, bipartisan in saying we want to see what the Speaker comes up with and how he wants to bring it to the floor and the rest. And at the end of the day, there will be a choice to be made. But I, I'd rather not have our members be placed on a spot that maybe, maybe they want to be put on the spot. But I, I, I like to keep all options open, my colleagues. I would, I would agree that the options being open, as the leader said, is important. Uh, is, is, it, uh, is that extra layering of the Corker Amendment, I've called it excessive and overkill. I still believe that's the case. Uh, we have a difficult situation here in the House. What is going to come out of this House? What are going to be the ramifications of anything proceeding from here? So keeping one's powder dry as we go forward is probably, for me personally, uh, the wisest step. Uh, but, but like I said, we all have opinions about that extra layer. Yeah. It's, it's part of the process. As you know, it's got to go. It's not final bill. It's part of the process. We've got to go through the process itself. And we, I, I, you know, I always support the prerogatives of the House, and I want the House to have a bill that goes to conference where the right. debate will take place. I think the pa Senate passing a bill gives leverage to those who want a bill in the House because the pressure is on them to do something if you want to exercise the prerogatives of the House. So we view it as a positive step in that it, it has passed. It will be a, an instrument at conference but hopefully it will help us get the best possible bill to go to conference with it. Madam Leader, could you elaborate on, if you don't mind, could you elaborate on the um, House Democratic position supporting path to citizenship? Does that mean ahead of conference you would whip against individual bills that don't have a path to citizenship unless you're guaranteed path to citizenship vote? Does that have to happen Well, first? you know what, let's see what the Republican, today, the Republicans are meeting at 3 o'clock. We have votes, so we're going to have to go, too. And that is, uh, the, 
I hope that they will be hearing from the bipartisan group that has been meeting for a period of time. It is my understanding, but I have no first-hand knowledge of that. It. It's my understanding uh, that le they worked into the night and have a proposal that they will be, perhaps they'll be presenting in whole and in part there. So I take this one step at a time, and I've said to the speaker, however, you know, we want a comprehensive immigration bill. If he wants to bring it in parts, that's his prerogative. Uh, we want comprehensive immigration reform at the end of the day to go to the table. Leader, yes. But, you know, Senator Schumer met with your conference yeah. or your caucus earlier this week and said that it was a non-starter if this House immigration bill were to come out without a pathway to citizenship. And a lot of the members seem to be saying that mm -hmm. a path to legal status would be something that they think can, could possibly pass through the House. Is that something that a path to legal status, is that something that you think the Democratic caucus could actually support, considering it's not technically a pathway to citizenship? I think that uh, uh, Senator Schumer's uh, comments uh, reflected the enthusiasm that he saw in the room for a path uh, to legal, permanent legal status, and that's a path uh, to citizenship. But, but in, in terms of how would how would you react if, if the bill were to come to the floor and just be a pathway to legal status? I mean, well, so why don't you take a look at what they're going to bring to the floor and what they can pass. You know, in other words, at some point, there, a bill has to pass, whatever it may be. And uh, can they even pass? Can they even pass a bill without a path to citizenship? Say so, so you take that out. Can they pass that bill? So again, we're in a legislative uh, process now. The House works its will. And the question is, can a bill without a path of legalization even pass the House on the Republican side? Yes, no, we have both, but I'll take yours because uh, it came back. <laughs> <laughs> We've been crunching um, some of the demographics in these in Republican districts and found, you know, three fourths of the House Republican districts are white. Um, on average, they're just 10 percent Hispanic, um, and even the handful of GOP districts that have a sizable Hispanic population are not competitive districts. We have them rated at around plus nine in favor of the Republican Party. Is there the same incentive in the House to pass immigration reform? Why should House Republicans do this when the argument on the Senate side is it was in their political well, interest? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, the Republicans in the Senate had an epiphany when they saw 70 percent of the Hispanic community voted for President Obama and voted for Democrats uh, for Congress. So they realized they had to address the issue because if you want to win statewide, you have to make as many friends as possible. Uh, I, I think that they have cloaked their language in more values-based uh, respect for the immigrant contribution to our country, which is who we are, a nation of immigrants. And, uh, and so I, I would hope that those values are shared by our colleagues in the House. Many of us vote on issues that we think are for the good of the country that have absolutely nothing to do with our districts. For example, I have, they tell me I have one farm in my district. It's a mushroom farm. It's very dark in there. And, uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, so, you know, again, we're a country. We come here to represent our districts. Uh, but also recognizing that we have ne we are uh, members of the House of Representatives to act for the uh, the good of the country. But I know one thing: uh, as a Democrat in the House, I'm also glad we have a Democratic president in the White House. And if they ever expect to have a Republican president in the White House, he or she will have to carry those states that are heavily um, immigrant uh, a, a newcomer, whether they're from Mexico or whether they're from Asia or whether they're from Africa or whether they're from Asia, where did I say Asia twice? Uh, <laughs> uh, wherever, uh, wherever they're from. But I, let's hope everybody's doing what they believe is for the good uh, of our country. And we believe that regardless of the fact that there may be a low percentage of Hispanics, that many of those districts support comprehensive immigration reform. Many of the people. That, uh, would you speak yeah, to I, that? You know, that I think the, the struggle going on, and we've seen it played out in the Republican Party, and it's probably the struggle that's going to, going to start at 3 o'clock, short-term versus long-term. Is there a short-term political advantage by doing nothing and continuing the same rhetoric that we've heard for the last 10 years? Probably. In this long-term, absolutely there's a loss. So that's their struggle, and a huge political struggle. Thank you. Thank you. Over.
Thank you all very much. Thank you. Yeah, it was good. It was kind of finished. Um, basically, we talked about it. Uh, <laughs> On this boat, the yeas are 182, the nays are 243. The amendment is not adopted. The unfinished business is the request of, for a recorded vote on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. First amendment offered by Mr. Burgess of Texas. The recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of request for the recorded vote will rise and be counted. A, a sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a five minute vote. This is the first of two amendments in this series offered by Congressman Burgess, Burgess of Texas. Uh, this one would cut $48 million from domestic uranium enrichment programs. Four more votes after this one. More from the Associated Press. Uh, the story saying that the latest prominent Republican to wade into the immigration debate was former President George W. Bush, who today urged Congress to reach a positive resolution on overhauling immigration laws. Here's what he had to say. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome to Freedom Hall. It, I am uh, incredibly grateful uh, to be able to witness this joyous and uplifting ceremony. It will be inspiring to see people of different ages and different countries raise their right hands and take the oath to become citizens of the United States. All who swear the oath of citizenship are doing more than completing a legal process. You're making a lifetime pledge to support the values and laws of America. The pledge comes with great privileges. It also comes with great responsibilities. For some of you, the day comes after a long and difficult journey. For all of you, this is a defining moment in your lives. America is your country. It is more than a home. I welcome you to this free nation. I congratulate you and your families. And it's an honor to call you fellow Americans. Our immigrant heritage has enriched America's history. It continues to shape our society. 
Each generation of Americans, of immigrants, brings a renewal to our national character and adds vitality to our culture. Newcomers have a special way of appreciating the opportunities of America, and when they seize those opportunities, our whole nation benefits. In the 1790s, an immigrant from Ireland designed the White House. I'm familiar with the place. <laughs> he did a fine job. He also helped build the Capitol. In the 1990s, 200 years later, an immigrant from Russia helped create the internet search engine Google. In between, new citizens have made contributions in virtually every professional field. And millions of newcomers have strengthened their communities through their hard work, through their love of family, and through their faith. We're a nation of immigrants, and we must uphold that tradition, which has strengthened our country in so many ways. We're also a nation of laws, and we must enforce our laws. America can be a lawful society and a welcoming society at the same time. We can uphold our traditions of assimilating immigrants and honoring our heritage of a nation built on the rule of law. But we have a problem. The laws governing the immigration system aren't working. The system is broken. We're now in an important debate in reforming those laws. And that's good. I don't intend to get involved in the politics or the specifics of policy. But I do hope there is a positive resolution to the debate. And I hope during the debate that we keep a benevolent spirit in mind and that we understand the contributions immigrants make to our country. We must remember that the vast majority of immigrants are decent people who work hard and support their families and practice their faith and leave responsible lives. Some willingly defend the flag, including two who are about to take the oath here today. At its core, immigration is a sign of a competent and successful nation. It says something about our country, that people all around the world are willing to leave their homes and leave their families and risk everything to come to our country. Their talent and hard work and love of freedom have helped us become the leader of the world. Our generation must ensure that America remains a beacon of liberty and the most hopeful society the world has ever known. We must always be proud to welcome people as fellow Americans. Our new immigrants are just what they've always been, people willing to risk everything for the dream of freedom. America remains what she has always been, the great hope on the horizon, a blessed and promised land. We honor the heritage of all who come here, no matter where they come from, because we trust in our country's genius for making us all Americans, one nation under God. It's a joyful day for you all, and it's one you'll always remember and so will I. In a few moments, we will share the same title, a title that has meant this more vote, to me. The yeas are 114, the nays are 308. The, the amendment is not adopted. The unfinished business is the request for a recorded vote on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess on which the further proceedings were postponed, on which the votes were, uh, on which the no's were prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Burgess of Texas. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having risen, 
A recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a five-minute vote. This next amendment, another one from Congressman Burgess, would remove $48 million for domestic uranium enrichment research and development programs. Some news from today. The Hill reports that the Federal Aviation Administration announced that it would require pilots to have 1,500 hours of flight training before they could fly a commercial airplane. The new threshold is a huge jump from the 250 flight hours previously required and comes days after the crash of an Asiana Airlines flight in San Francisco that killed two people and injured more than 180. The experience of pilots has been a major focus of the Asiana Airlines crash since the company revealed this week that the pilot of the jet that crashed in San Francisco was training to learn how to fly the Boeing 777. That from the Hill.
yeas are 131 and the nays are 291 and the amendment is not adopted. The, un the unfinished business is the request for a recorded vote on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Nevada, Ms. Titus, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment offered by Ms. Titus of Nevada. Recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. Sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic devices. A five minute vote. Representative Titus of Nevada offered uh, the amendment the House is voting on now. It would prevent the Energy Department from moving forward with plans to close Yucca Mountain. The Senate today did not advance legislation that would reverse a federal student loan interest rate hike that took effect on July 1st. CQ Roll Call writes that senators rejected 51 to 49, a motion that would have extended for one year a 3.4 percent interest rate on subsidized undergraduate Stafford loans. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid said several senators from both parties met this morning. A deal is sought on whether and how to include a cap on market-based interest rates to protect borrowers. One more vote after this one.
Both the yeas are 87 and the nays are 337, and the amendment is not adopted. The unfinished business is the request for a recorded vote on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Lynch of Massachusetts. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote. The last vote in this series on an amendment that would move $20 million from fossil fuel research into Army Corps of Engineers construction programs. In addition to live House and Senate coverage tomorrow, we'll also have a Pentagon briefing with the commander of the U.S. Pacific Command. That's live at 9 a.m. Eastern. Also, a House Natural Resources Subcommittee hearing on wildfire and forest management at 10 a.m. Eastern. And in the afternoon at 2.15, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee confirmation hearing for three nominees, including Victoria Newland to be Assistant Secretary for European and Eurasian Affairs. All that on C-SPAN 3 tomorrow. Up next here in the House, more amendment debate on the energy and water spending bill.
The ayes are 217 and the nays are 206 and the amendment is adopted. The committee will be in order. Will members please remove, remove your conversations from the floor? Will be in order. <laughs> 